Well, last week I started to talk about why when Jesus says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will he, the Father, your Heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to those that ask, and how we're to continually be asking for the Holy Spirit. And because it represents our desire for Him and our dependence upon Him. And so I went over seven things last week concerning that. And so tonight I want to continue, and by God's grace, I want, hopefully we'll finish tonight. But I, I want to talk about these reasons from Scripture why we need to depend on Him. Last week actually we talked about how it says that God says that you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses. And we, I talked about how God doesn't anoint us necessarily to be preachers, but every one of us can be witnesses. Amen. And, you know, I was having a discussion with Brother Bruce last week, and I thought to myself, I should bring that up. You know, one of the things you can do to be a witness for the Lord, if you're in a, like an office setting, is to, to print some pictures that are significant to you. Things that maybe that, are, that were monumental in your life, or are testimony of seeing God's glory. Something, something that will provoke a discussion. You know, pictures can be very powerful to declare and to share the mighty works of God. So I want to encourage you, maybe that's one way that you can be a witness on your job site, is to even have some pictures available or have them there so that people can see and ask, and they will open the door for you to share and to testify. I want to go into number eight tonight, number eight tonight, of why we should be depending on the Holy Spirit and desiring Him. That's found in Romans 8.14, and that's because the Holy Spirit leads us. 8.14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons or the daughters of God. In Acts chapter 10, verse 19, it says, While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, Three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. The Spirit spoke that to Peter. Or Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Acts chapter 15, verse 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to my Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Friend, the early church, according to the Scriptures, was accustomed to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now there will be some those today, God bless those who maybe have brought up in a certain persuasion, that say, well, once the canon was closed, the Spirit doesn't speak to, to God's people anymore in that way. Friend, that's, that, that, that actually goes in contrary to Scripture. The Scriptures are complete. They are the final authority. But, the, but if we do that, we can have the tendency to exalt the apostles. We exalt the men rather than the Holy Spirit who used them. Can I get an amen to that? We can say the acts of the apostles, but really it's the acts of the Holy Spirit. And that, that we use the apostles in that process. We all, the, the Bible's clear. Jesus says in John chapter 10, He is the good shepherd and his sheep hear his voice. The Holy Spirit desires to speak with us. And I submit to you tonight something that I have heard and I believe in and I continue to repeat it. And that is this. If you want to hear the voice of God, if you have the intention to obey what God will speak to you before he speaks, you'll never lack in hearing God's voice. If you have the intention to obey what God will speak to you before He speaks, you'll never lack in hearing God's voice. The issue is, so many times, is that people, they have heard the voice of God, but they don't want to obey what He's told them. But when we are obedient, the Lord continues to disclose revelation to us. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. 
Let me, let me just say this before I go to the next point. I'll, I'll, some simple principles that I use, that I believe in, that I learned when I was in the Bible. Very simple of hearing God's voice. That it gives an added confidence to me. Number one, I come into a position of thanksgiving. I come into a position of praise first. I fix my eyes on Him. I, I, I bring my attention to who He is and I worship. Secondly, we're, I'm going through the Lord's Prayer here. I make sure that I haven't had unconfessed sin in my heart. I deal with that issue in my life. Thirdly, I submit to God. I submit everything. And one of the things I submit to Him when I want to hear Him speak to me is I submit my own imaginations. I submit my own thoughts. And by doing that, I have the assurance that I've asked and I will receive. See, the problem is sometimes you don't ask to submit your imagination and your thoughts. And so when God speaks, you say to yourself, was that me or was that God? But if you've asked Him, then you have the assurance that He's heard you. So I make sure that I submit everything to God. Lord, I submit my imagination, my preconceived ideas. I submit my thoughts to you. I bring every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. And then I resist the enemy in the name of Jesus, according to James 4, 7, who must flee. And then I thank him for what he wants to speak to me. And he speaks, friends. He's faithful to speak. Very simple principles, but I practice it. I've practiced it for years and years and years. And the Father is never faithful, is ever faithful to speak as well as the Holy Spirit. So I, I, I just want to encourage you in that way. Number nine, the Holy Spirit bears witness in our hearts that we are the children of God. Romans 8.15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we also, also may be glorified together. Some of you are familiar with the second most sold book in history behind the Bible. Anybody know what it is? Pilgrim's Progress. Second most published book in history behind the Bible. If you haven't read it, friend, you need to read it. I believe every Christian should read Pilgrim's Progress. It came to by way of dreams to John Bunyan. I'm telling you, it, it's clearly the Lord that gave revelation. And it's amazing because it fleshes out the Christian walk in such a profound way that you'll get so much insight from. But there's a part in that Pilgrim's Progress. And by the way, there was a recent movie made of it. I thought it was pretty, I thought it was well done. It was, I don't think it was done in like 2005, I think around that time. And they modernized it. I recommend it. It was well done. In fact, I put a Bible study to it because I used it when I was on Pine Ridge. If any of you get the movie, you want to use it in a five-part Bible series, I'll get those notes to you. I'll be happy to forward those to you because it's packed with scripture and awesome insights. But there's a, there's a point where pilgrim, Christian, is coming. He's already come to the cross. The, the, the burden of sin has already rolled off his shoulder. He comes into the house where he has been given the armor of God. And he moves now into the valley of humiliation. See, this is what we need to do. That's why the progress is so powerful. Because it declares, it shows many times what is contrary to our culture... Well, you've come to Christ, and now everything's going to be wonderful. No, it's not going to be like that, is it? It's a battle. It's a war. As Leonard Ravenel said, you've not moved into a playground. You've moved into a battleground. And we have not prepared many people for that reality, that this is a war. And so you see Pilgrim coming to the Valley of Humiliation, and he meets with the devil. And what happens? What does, what does Satan do to Pilgrim right away? He, he, he goes through what his name means. The name devil means slanderer. Diabolos. And that's what he does. He says to him, I'll, I'll pay you to come back to me. 
And then when that doesn't work, he says, Well, well you've already failed him. You remember when you did this? Remember you when you were in the slope of the spawn? And that's exactly what the devil does. He seeks to bring accusation and condemnation. And Pilgrim says, What you say is true, but my king has forgiven me. Hallelujah. And even when he crosses the river, when he's crossing over the river symbolizing death into heaven, he's plagued with doubts, but he remembers the truths of God's word, and that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Friend, it's significant. It's significant that the Holy Spirit bears witness in our hearts that we are the children of God. That is the helmet of salvation that protects our minds when the accuser comes to accuse. Can I get an amen to that? Number 12. Did I say it right? Oh, we're on 10. I'm moving too fast. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 5. The Holy Spirit empowers us not to walk in the flesh. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Hallelujah, friend. Jesus did not just save us from the penalty of sin. He saved us from the power of sin. Amen. You hear good, well-meaning Christians say, the only difference between me and you is that I'm forgiven. No, that's not the only difference. Christ lives in you. You're not the same anymore. He's given you authority and power to be victorious and to walk this world in white. Hallelujah. I'm living testimony of that. You guys can testify. I can remember. I was a slave to sin, friends. But Christ set me free. And if I would have stayed back there, I would have been going on the path of death. But Christ, He is sanctifying us and making us and conforming us into His image. I praise the Lord that He has given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to walk this walk. Come on, church. He has given us the Holy Spirit that we can have our minds set on things above, not on things of the earth. But it's true, we will conform to what we gaze upon. And if you gaze at the world long enough, friend, you will look like the world. You gaze on the beauty of Christ, you gaze on the beauty of the Word of God, you'll be conformed to that. We must gaze upon Him. Number 11, the Holy Spirit has come to give us spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are nine gifts that are mentioned. By the way, in verse 11, it, it says that as the Spirit determines, He gives the gifts. Not as we determine. The Holy Spirit is not going to be treated like some kind of some kind of actor being told what to do. He's God, amen, and he determines where he will give the gifts so that, he, that those gifts will be used for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ. Not to bring recognition or some kind of attention to ourselves, but to glorify him. Now the Bible does say that we can earnestly desire these gifts. But our motive must be pure. It's for God's glory, not ours. What are the gifts? The word of wisdom. That doesn't just mean like, this, this man over here, this one over here, they, they have such wisdom. That's not what it's talking about, friend. This is a supernatural gift that the word of wisdom is, is given in a moment and you begin to articulate things that you know are not of you. You can see this operating through the life of Jesus Christ. 
He operated by the power of the Holy Spirit as he depended. He became our example. You saw him operating the word of wisdom. For example, when the Pharisees are coming and they say, talking about who, who should we render, you know, to, you, to the things of Caesar. And, and Jesus says, give me, give me the coin. Whose face is on it? That, that was a word of wisdom that he silenced them in that moment to say, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. Or that word of wisdom we just sing about when, when the adulteress is called in adultery and she's brought before them and the Holy Spirit, Jesus speaks under that word of wisdom and says, let him who has no sin cast the first stone. Bam! It's supernatural wisdom for a particular situation or a trial. The word of knowledge. It's when you get information that's not of you that comes into you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've seen this operate many times in my wife's life. One time, I remember a testimony where she sees a guy and she sees the word divorce written across him. She didn't know who he is. It was a word of knowledge. She comes up to him, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you, is someone that you know, or, or have you been divorced? Immediately he starts to cry. That he had come all the way from California trying to escape his past, going to a place that no one knew where he, where he was or who he was, but God knew where he was. And it opened the way for him to come to Jesus. The word of knowledge gives an information for the point. We see that happening with Jesus, with the, with the woman from Samaria. When she, he goes to the well, he has a word of knowledge, and he says to her, you've, you've, you're right, you have, you've had five of them, five husbands. And he begins to disclose, disclose information, and she knows there's no way that he would have known that other than through God. Thirdly, there's the gift of faith. The gift of faith. This, this is not like, this is supernatural in a moment that the Holy Spirit inspires you to believe for a situation that looks impossible. It's a great trial. There's something, but if someone has the gift of faith in the body of Christ, they look at that and by the power of the Holy Spirit, they don't speak presumptuously. They don't just say nice things of what you want to hear. It carries the weight of God's presence that what they're saying is right. God's going to do this. He's going to do something in this situation. I've seen this operate many times through my mom who moves in this gift. It's not like just nice words. You feel the weight of God's presence bearing witness in that moment of trial that there's a gift of faith to edify the body. Hang on. God's coming through. Keep your eyes on Him. Then there's the gifts of healing. I've seen this operate in different people many times. I, one time I remember it was cool to see it operate through my, my son. We came back to Steel Creek, it was I think 2012, six years ago. It might have been before, I, 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 but I think it was, that's when it was. And I'm, we're sitting in the sanctuary here at Steel Creek, and my son says to me, he says, Dad, God's telling me I need to go pray for that woman over there. And we were new, I mean, he didn't know anybody. And I said, okay, just wait till after the service. He, I mean, he was ready to go, right then and there. I said, just wait, wait. And so, God forgive me, I forgot. The service ended, and, and I totally forgot that Caleb felt impressed to go pray for this woman over here. And she left. Well, Caleb didn't forget. He ran after her. And he met her, he met her after somewhere like in the, in the hallway, uh, the foyer area, and, and, he, and he started to pray, and there was knowledge that as, she, as he asked, how can I pray, that she had a, a severe pain in her chest to the point that it was difficult to breathe. She was with her grandchild. And he says, well, can I pray for you? And she was like, oh, isn't this so sweet, you know? It's nice, it's nice little boy praying for me. And so he laid hands on her, prayed that the Lord would heal her. And she still was like, oh, that's so sweet. And he walks away, and she takes a few steps, and she takes a deep breath and realizes the pain is gone. And I, I was in the front, and she, she, Caleb came right back in, and she's looking all over the place for Caleb because she's healed. This is going on for months. And finally, she finds him, and he... She, he leads her to, to me, and she tells that she's crying, saying what all the story was, what happened. Of course, I'm starting to cry, because I hear what God has done. 
And she turns to him and says, I want to thank you. And, and Caleb says, just give glory to God and go and testify. That was a good word, Caleb. That was a good word. <laughs> the gifts of miracle, the gift of miracles. This, is, this word in the Greek is dunamis, the same word that was used when Jesus says, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The same word. This is the gift of God's power, instant display of God's power. Supernatural intervention. One testimony that comes to my mind very quickly about this is when we were back in Jackson Park. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Some of you have heard this testimony and some of you haven't. I'm going to share it tonight. But we were praying and there was a guy there in that program at that time that was involved with a chemical explosion years ago. He's inside of a tanker cleaning out the inside of a tanker and he thought it was empty and, and it imploded and, and it blew up and it came right into his face. And it burnt the first several layers of his eyes. Seven years ago. Seven years at that point when we met him. And they didn't think he'd see again. But they ended up sewing his eyes shut for, I don't know, like weeks. Or even months, I think. And when they undid him, they thought he would, they wouldn't see what he could see. But it was really difficult. And he was ultra light sensitive. And his eyes were the color of like a blind man. It was like a gray, milky white color. And in fact, the, the, explo the chemical explosion had burnt the color of his iris. So he had like, like eyes of a blind man, looks like. And that night, there's 14 brothers, and there was one brother there who's operating the gift of miracles. Uh, this brother, uh, our brother Joel, has operated this gift for a long time. And as we're praying together, we pray over this, this man, and Joel, has him take because he has to wear sunglasses even in this kind of light real thick sunglasses uh, dark sunglasses he takes them off and he has his eyes like this closed and the brothers gather around him and Joel just simply says in the name of Jesus Christ be healed and he says open your eyes I was like well that's bold and he opens his eyes and he starts yelling he goes oh it's burning it's burning and all of a sudden he goes what what the and we're like, what? He's like, I'm crying, I'm crying. And we didn't realize what was the big deal. He says, you don't understand. I haven't cried in however many years. Because when the chemical explosion happened, it burned his tear ducts. And so he's crying. We're like, whoa, God's doing something. But we look at him. Then I'm, sitting, I'm sitting next to Joel. And he turns around. And Joel says, look at me. And I look at Justin. And I see his eyes are still that milky white color. He's like looking, he's squinting like this. We could see just like a gray, white color. And someone says, you remember when Jesus prayed over the blind man? He says, I see men walking as trees, and he prayed over a second time. He said, yeah, let's pray over a second time. So we lay hands on this guy a second time. Friend, I, I'm telling you what. No one can tell me that Jesus Christ is not Lord. I'm telling you, they laid hands on this man, and I, I had the amazing privilege to see what happened. He turned around, and when he, we were all in a circle, when he turned, he faced me, he opened his eyes, and his eyes twirled to dark brown right before my eyes. Like a whirlpool. And I went, Wah! I screamed, and I turned to Joel, and I grabbed him, and I said, I just saw the glory of God! And we both took off like little kids running around, screaming around the gym at 1 o'clock in the morning. Jesus is alive, friend. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The gift of prophecy. It's, I believe it's not just foretelling or foretelling, it's both. I believe it's fore and foretelling. This isn't adding to Scripture. Scripture is the final authority. Paul says, we know in part and we prophesy in part. And he says, all prophecy is to be tested. Some people think that like, if, you, if, 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 if something is like partial, that it's all erroneous. No, that's not what it's saying. We're imperfect vessels. It is to be tested. That's the beauty of the body of Christ of accountability. But it will never contradict Scripture. But it's very powerful to see the gift of prophecy used. I remember my family and I, we were coming through Kansas City, and this dear brother, Brother Hackett, he, I, I never met him before. He's like, can I pray over you guys? I'm like, sure, you know, I don't know who he is. 
And the five of us get in this room together and he starts praying. It's, it's kind of awkward. It's kind of like quiet and I'm like, I'm like, okay, where's this going, you know? And, and all of a sudden he looks at me and he starts speaking things about my life to the ages. Never met this man. He's telling me the times of my life that I've had encounters with God. He's giving me the ages. Then he turns to my wife, speaks very specific things also to her that he would never know, and then proceeded to go through my children and speak very specific things that bore witness in all of our hearts that he, he never knew us. I'll tell you, brother, the gift of prophecy is a beautiful thing. It edifies. And he talks about this yet. And he actually talked about this service. He actually prophesied before we even knew we were going to be doing this. It's really amazing to see that gift operating. It's really beautiful. We need to embrace what the Holy Spirit wants to do. The next gift of the Spirit is discerning of spirits. My mentor, who I mentioned before, Pastor Stuart Deal, who I honor, that man prayed hours for me, hours for my wife. Hours for our family and our ministry. Died at the age of 96. The man moved in the power of God in ways I've, I've, a few I've, I've ever met in my life. Dear Southern pa Baptist preacher, don't ever judge people by their denomination. I, found, I find more spiritual people and denominations that people reject than those who claim they have the power of God. And he... He would tell me over and over again, he'd say, Wade, I, you need to pray above all for the gift of discerning of spirits. Because in these last days, there's going to be great deception. And the body of Christ needs to be alert. And we're walking around as the body of Christ, and I'm telling you, friend, we're not doing what we're commanded to do in 1 John 4, 1, where John says, my beloved, do not believe every spirit. You need to test the Spirit. Do the 4-1 test. 1 John 4-1 and 1 Timothy 4-1. What does 1 Timothy 4-1 say? The Spirit clearly says in the last days that there will be some that will depart from the faith. Why will they depart from the faith? Because they will believe seducing spirits. They will believe doctrines of devils. We must have in the body of Christ the gift of discerning of spirits. Can I get an amen to that? Because the devil can imitate gifts, but he can't imitate fruit. I think it's significant, and I submit to you tonight, Smith Wigglesworth is where I learned this from, and I believe it's true. There are nine gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and there are nine fruit of the Spirit. And if you go down the line, they should be matching up with each other. And he pointed out, and others have pointed out, that the, the garments around the priest, we're, we're called to be a royal priesthood. Around the garment of the priest, there was a bell and there was a pomegranate. There was a bell and there was a pomegranate. The miracles are like the bells, right? We love to see the signs and the sound and all, of the, all the attention. But that fruit should be right there to buffer that and to balance that. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, if I have not love, I'm a clean symbol. So you look at it, friend, it's very, I think it's very beautiful. The word of wisdom is to be spoken in love. The word of knowledge, oftentimes, is accompanied with the, with the fruit of joy. The gift of faith, what happens when we manifest faith, true faith, there's a peace. People that often operate in gifts of healing, many times have to know what long-suffering is about. Because many people believe that you pray one time and it's over. No, friend, you've got to persevere in prayer. It's long-suffering. You don't just leave someone in their, their place. You walk with them. You walk with them. All the way down. You can do that, and I believe they're to, they're, they marry each other. They are to match each other. The Holy Spirit wants to use His gifts through the fruit that He, that he manifests. I remember one testimony that came to my mind concerning discerning of spirits. Obviously, we saw it in Acts 16 with Paul, right? With the, with the young lady of divination. I mean, every appearance would be 
These are the servants of God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. I mean, she seems like she's speaking the truth, right? And Paul turns around and says, come out of her in Jesus' name. What? Yeah, that's the discerning of spirits. You're recognizing what's the Holy Spirit and what's not. Because the Holy Spirit is like a dove. He's meek. He's humble. But when you start seeing self-exaltation, when you start seeing people proclaiming about men and exalting men, friend, you can be sure that the Holy Spirit is not in that. Jesus is the one that gets exalted. Amen. But I remember one testimony that comes to my mind. I'll share this quickly on this last point of discerning of spirits. So I met my wife would be back in Cincinnati. They were moving into a new house. And they felt that there were some things that were not right in that place. You know, the Bible says that we can devote things to God and it would be holy unto Him. I encourage you to declare God's Lordship over your home. If you haven't already. And do it all the time. So just declare that Jesus, you're the Lord of this place. But they moved into a new place and they felt something wasn't right. So they asked for an intercessory team to come to their house and pray through their home. And one of the people in that team had the gift of discerning of spirits. It's beautiful when the body of Christ works together. One of them was an intercessor. They come into the house and they sense the presence of an unclean spirit before them at the edge of this hallway. Something dark. And they come against it in the name of Jesus. And the, the, the person with discerning of spirits says, this is the spirit of lust. And they're coming, leave in Jesus' name. And it's not leaving. It's right there. They're like, what's going on? Why isn't this thing leaving? And the intercessor, this is why we need to hear the voice of God. We talked about hearing God's voice. She's listening for the voice of the Lord. And she gets revelation. Go, go get like a, like a top of a broom. So this is a new home. They, they, they're moving in. And, and there's a tile up in the hallway. They take the broom and they open it up. And out of the tile comes all of this pornographic literature. That's why that thing wasn't leaving. They had property there. It needed to be removed. It needed to be trashed and burned. See, the devil comes for his own property. That's why we need the gifts of the Spirit. Friend. This is the beauty when the body works together that we can walk in knowledge and the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. Finally, the last two are tongues and interpretation of tongues. I remember a very powerful testimony. I had the honor because of a dear friend named Jack Wilson. I was invited up to the missions conference, to speak at the missions conference of the Brooklyn Tabernacle back in 2006. And the brother that led our time of coming together, Dick Brogdon, was a dear brother in Christ, mighty man of God. He came together. He was speaking at Brooklyn Tabernacle that morning. And he gave testimony. He wanted to encourage Brooklyn Tabernacle because he said the last time he was there, he was ministering in Khartoum, Sudan, under heavy persecution. And while he was ministering in Brooklyn Tabernacle that Sunday morning, someone, now you get the picture of Brooklyn Tabernacle, there's thousands of people there. And they're quiet before the Lord. And all of a sudden, someone stands up and starts speaking in tongues. And Jim Simbola waits for the interpretation. Sure enough, a few moments later, interpretation comes back. And the interpretation was, it's okay. I'm protecting them. Your team is safe right now in Khartoum. And begins to relay that there's a hedge of protection, that, like, like an angelic protection around that place. And Dick was standing there going, praise the Lord, like I've already assumed that, that my team is safe in Khartoum. And he goes on to preach his message. But then he finds out later that at the moment that that tongue was given and the interpretation, that there was a mob that was systematically going around and, and cocktailing and burning foreign uh, buildings and killing people. And they had come to his team's building. At the moment that the tongues and interpretation was given, they were getting ready to attack his team's building. And they said they, the team looked out the window and supernaturally, they just got up and they left. Come on. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. 
the beauty of the body of Christ and the beauty of God's gifts being manifest. Number 12, I'm, gonna, I'm coming down here. The Holy Spirit brings hope. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? How many know we need hope in this society right now? There's an epidemic of depression and oppression and even suicide. And the Holy Spirit wants to use you as you are filled with His hope to bring hope to the hopeless. Number 13, the Holy Spirit teaches us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. Hallelujah! You and I, friend, have the revelation of the Scriptures to come open to open our eyes by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why when I talked about praying through the tabernacle, you saw that part where you come into the holy place and there is the, the, the candlestick representing the Holy Spirit, asking for His help, asking for His illumination, and you turn and there's a the table of showbread representing the Word of God, asking for the light of the Holy Spirit to bring revelation to God's Word because it's living Hallelujah. It's living and active. It's not just a book. It is the living Word of God. And that's why David could pray of Psalm 119, Open my eyes. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may behold the wonderful truths of the works of your law. That God wants to open our eyes to the truths of of the scripture through the power of the Holy Spirit. For I want to encourage you before you read the word of God to ask for the helper's help. He is the paraclete. He is waiting, but you do not have, I do not have if we do not ask. We need to ask for the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds to the word of God. I'm telling you friend, you do that and you get hip you get habitual in that, you'll be amazed at the revelation you'll receive. Amazed. It just comes alive in you. You're like, whoa. You feel the, the burning. You feel the, as, as, just as it was on the road of, uh, to Emmaus. We're not our hearts burning in us. As he spoke to us, there is a, his word is living. His word is fire. Number 14, these are the last two. Appropriately, number 14, he empowers us to pray. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I have seen a night and day difference when I just pray what I think I ought to pray versus when I take a moment to pause and say, Holy Spirit, help me to pray. I have consistently seen when I am doing that and I'm asking for His help that I find Him inspiring my prayer and to pray things that I was not anticipating to pray. Why don't we as a church ask for the Holy Spirit's help to help us to pray? What is going on here? He is the helper. Why are we not asking the helper to help us? How little time do we give recognition to him to help us? We just presume, we just assume, we go on, and we've never consulted him to ask for his empowerment. Which brings me to the last point. The Holy Spirit empowers us and helps us to worship. 
And this goes back to point three that I talked about last Saturday. That the Holy Spirit has come to glorify Jesus. And Jesus says in John chapter 4, what? That God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If there is no truth, friend, you have chaos. You have no banks to the river. And you got all kinds of crazy things that begin to go out of order. Because it's not hemmed in with truth. You don't have the spirit, you got dead orthodoxy. You got a lack of life. You got motions. I think that one of the most beautiful pictures of where you see that balance is Ezekiel 37. Where Ezekiel is told, he looks at the valley of dry bones and, he, and he's told, prophesy over this. And that's the word of God. You prophesy and what happens? Things come into order. Hallelujah. Things come into order. All things are to be done in decency and order. It comes in order under the authority of the word of God. But it's just a standing army that's dead. Until what comes? Until the spirit comes. Then it becomes alive. Hallelujah. Friend, you can have the most gifted worship time with the most latest worship songs and it's just a performance. And you have someone who's in the Holy Spirit who has nothing but his voice saying kumbaya my Lord and the glory of God will fall. May we as a church understand our need of him to empower us to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. We need the Holy Spirit to help us to worship as we ought. So tonight went longer than normal. Is that all right? Praise the Lord. And so I want to just close with saying the way we're going to go into next week, by God's grace, if you're able to join us, the command is be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I want to, that's going to be a segue into the rest of that verse that says how we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's very significant. So next week, I encourage you, if you haven't already memorized Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 and verse 20, I encourage you to memorize those verses and to believe and know it's the will of God for us to be continuously filled with the Holy 